There it is. Cheers. Yeah, the um <clears throat> but yeah, that and that and that might be good to uh to state right now. It's like we are me and me and Luke forgot to hit the record button, but uh good morning, evening, afternoon. But we we're just discussing like the whole intent and how these conversations started and it's for the benefit not only of us like because it's edifying but it's for the benefit of our wives we were sitting around a campfire this past summer slash fall and uh just having these really great conversations and they were all spurring from the curiosity of our wives and them just like asking these heavy hitting hard just in-depth thick weighty questions about god um in in the and and so it ended up being you know 12 hours of on and off again conversations visiting theological truths tearing down i think some some strongholds that of tradition that that might have been there and just kind of challenging just what some christians would consider to be just things that they've held on to for a very long time confessing to one another you know letting each other know that we don't all have it right but we're striving towards the god who can make it right in our minds understanding that you know the mystery will remain after we end this 12 hour talk. Right. Um, and so this is our attempt to just continue those talks and to continue to explore the great mysteries of, of God, our King. And, um, if we can be entertaining, uh, great, but really we're here to just speak some truth and hopefully the Lord chooses to use our, our voices to bring some sort of clarification uh, or just some sort of truth to your doorstep, wherever that might be. So it's a long winded way of saying our wives are responsible for us talking at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning on these Wednesdays. So. Yeah. I, I heard it. I've heard it said that marriage is, <clears throat> if it's uh if it's a healthy marriage, it's one long conversation. <clears throat> and I feel like this is us trying to contribute to our conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. And speaking of, uh, my wife, um, yeah. was, ta was tasked with asking this question, uh, or, or bringing, bringing a topic up, which is kind of how we're doing it. It's like, just give me a question, give me a topic. And me and Luke, because we know everything in the Bible or, are, are just going to rip this thing apart. Uh, cause we know everything. It's like, she's asking questions. I don't know. I'm like, what in the world? Um, so I'm going to ask a series of questions, Luke, um, take in or any or all of them take hardly none of them and then we re revisit this at another time it doesn't matter just so long as we we touch it um she asked one question i'm going to break it up into different ones so her first initial one was how does satan tell us lies if he cannot hear our thoughts if he isn't omniscient omnipotent and omnipresent how does he tell us lies and that's how is really important not necessarily what even though i want to touch on what like how does he tell us lies if he cannot hear our thoughts and i'm going to break that up in a few more how does he know how or in what way does he attack us what does it even look like to be attacked are you tested by god versus being tested by satan like what's the difference uh, does God simply use Satan as a means to carry out his will and his testing? And I think one of the biggest ones we can focus on is like, what is the difference between being tempted by the world, the flesh, and by Satan? Because those are all different. So what I would say is like, take one of those and let's 
kind of start on it. Um, yeah. We'll probably only get to one, but. Yeah. Uh, well, I think there's a couple, couple ways that I would like to go. The, um, I'll start with the, just the basics, <clears throat> um, in terms of a, a general framework that I've found really helpful. Uh, so, um, obviously, uh, you know me there's always a book uh, obviously the book the bible um and then there's always a book that i've read that comes to mind so uh this is one of your recent, strengths sir yeah a recent one um that came out just a few years ago uh was uh it's called live no lies and it's written by uh, uh he, he was a pastor in um, portland but anyways he kind of um the subtitle is uh, recognize and resist the three enemies that sabotage your peace and the three enemies um are the world the flesh and the devil uh which is um kind of like the early church's framework um for uh doing what what is uh i, I don't even like the phrase because all the connotations that come with it but spiritual warfare um just acknowledging that um we are not in a uh, time of peace just yet um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that there's an enemy. Um, so the way that he kind of sums up kind of his thesis to the book, I sent it to you. Um, one of you sent me that question was, yeah. uh, that the devil, uh, well, I'll just say this, deceptive ideas, which come from the father of lies, uh, mm -hmm. play to our disordered desires, which is our flesh. We have disordered desires. Uh, St. Augustine wrote of that, um, and most uh, preachers around the world will, will talk about it from time to time. So deceptive ideas play to disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society, which is the world. So in the world, um, things that are not true are considered true. Um, things that are not real are considered real. So um, in that framework, you've got uh, the one who Jesus called um, the father of lies, the one who, when he lies, speaks his native tongue, um, who's been doing this a lot longer than us. Um, so he maybe inserts the ideas, make sure that they um, get brought up, uh, are, are there. If you've, the second book that I would recommend actually to read first would be um, the screw tape letters. Um mm. For anybody who mm -hmm. hasn't visited that regarding temptation, um, C.S. Lewis is a master of getting in the, uh, getting in, I, I don't know, every head uh, in terms yeah. of his writing. So um, just some recommendations to visit on people who've gone a little more in depth. Uh, Screw Tape Letters particularly is a really, uh, really short, it's pretty short uh, by Lewis's standards and, and accessible. I think a lot of high schools have it in their reading lists. Um, yeah. So, in, in so far as how does Satan tell us lies, uh, a couple things come to mind. Um, one is that he's been tempting people for thousands of years. Um, so, um, and that, as much as we like to think that we're highly evolved and advanced, um, our desires, our disordered desires, are not so different than they were. A thousand years ago, yeah, five thousand years ago, um, you can see in all through Scripture, men and women falling in ways that we still fall today. Um, one uh, one story that was referenced in something I was reading the other day was you know King David, who really had it going on. I mean, had uh, if you look at before he fell into temptation and basically broke every one of the 10 commandments in one stream of time, you know, took another man's wife, killed that man, lied about it. Um, you know, tried to cover it up. He coveted, he murdered, he committed adultery. He did all these things. And it was like, everything had kind of finally come together, which was not a short, easy path. Like he had endured to get to be where he was. And then he was like this King put his feet up, you know, which, um, and he bought a lie that he had done enough that, you know, and it's like, and that was the, um, 
That's he had bought the lie. Further. He bought he yeah. bought the lie that he had done enough. Yeah. And mm. I, I think I think that I'm gonna re, actually... I'm gonna revisit that in a minute. Okay. That's well, good. So the last thing I'm gonna say before I, I throw it back to you is um, you know, Rachel actually already is ahead of the game by saying, How does Satan tell us lies? That's actually she's already past the first point, which is to say that that is his primary means, really his only means of attacking and defeating is lies. Um, I I don't think, um, you know, I, I don't, well, for one thing, I don't believe that he is, um, he's a created being, you know, Satan, whatever you want to call um, the deceiver. Uh, I think that um, if that's the case, then I highly doubt that that I have ever had a direct encounter with um, this this being. Um, you know, and I don't think that out of seven billion people on the planet that I would warrant uh, his attention. Um, but that doesn't matter because the lies that he uses get to me just like they get to anyone else. Um, so, uh, you know, when people think about it. Um, I think that uh, I've heard it said from our, our pastor in our, in our church and, and many others that like a lot of people, when it comes to this, they either dismiss it completely, like the idea of spiritual warfare, or they like are over attentive to it. And they're like, I was engaged in spiritual warfare, you know, like in, in some really mundane task. And it's like, maybe, maybe you were just tired you know, you know, like yeah. maybe, maybe it's not always that. And I think that, you know, the balance is somewhere in between of acknowledging that there are uh, realities that we can't physically see, but that affect us just the same that we can combat um, with, uh, with truth. Um, because I think that that's what it comes down to is um, deception and truth or reality. Um and that's why, uh, kind of going back to what we talked about last week, um, when you see someone who doesn't know Jesus encounter truth and they want to keep digging, um, it's it's um, it's a really cool thing to watch happen. I think because I believe um, if you keep looking for truth. And um, I think that there's an element, a fundamental foundational element of uh, grace to this. But um, when you're able to see things as they are, eventually uh, you are led to the person who is truth, um, who is Jesus. Yeah. And, um, you know, the counter forces that we encounter are deception and lies. If you look at like any temptation that we face it's based on a deception a basic twisting of the truth uh or or sometimes just a, a an outright inversion of the truth like yeah. a full reversal but the best the best lies are uh are half truths um yeah. and a quote that i, I skimmed through this that, that book uh whenever you sent me the question um uh, one of the quotes from a movie was like uh talking about the greatest um, accomplishment of the devil was convincing the world that he didn't exist. And um, <laughs> because then, I mean, at that point you're free to do what you want. If nobody's on defense, it's easy to score points when there's no defense. Right. So, mm. um, so I think, yeah, that, that, that's just to open us up. Yeah. Good gracious. We do this every single time. I ask too many questions. You give not too many points, but so many points, and I'm stuck. That's probably too many. <laughs> well, 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 no. Let's uh, let's just yeah, just acknowledge that it's lies versus truth is the is. fundamental. That's I mean that's the fundamental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll I'll do my my broad kind of intro to this also and then touch on a specific point that you brought up and maybe that'll lead to something um just but to answer my wife directly you know how 
how does Satan, if he doesn't know our thoughts, how does he feed us lies? And what I would tell her if she was sitting right here and what I did tell her in brevity um, whenever she first brought it up was we have a a shared fallenness. We have a shared flesh and there are there are, there is a sin that is common to all of us that it addresses in scripture. And um, I wasn't even going to bring this up, but I, I will, I will bring it up. And it's actually, it, it was, I don't know if it is anymore, but it used to be my very favorite scripture. Um, and, and be honest, this is less about the devil. Um, we're going to circle back to it, but, you know, this is Galatians 5, 19 to 24, and it's the very first time after I mm. repented, and and I looked at this list. I, I repented in 2012. Um, I was, a, a, you know, backslid into sin and and then picked up the Bible probably for the very first time and was seeking and saw this verse, and it hit me harder than anything I had read up to this point. And I started in first Corinthians and it said, um, but if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, again, this isn't about Satan, but I'm getting there. It's going to, it's going to circle around. We're on the flesh. Now, if there's a difference between the world, the flesh and the devil, the works of the flesh are this and sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. It's like, it's like that is the list of things that are evidences of or symptoms of someone who is owned completely by the flesh. And then it says, but the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I look at that list as a 23 year old man. And I realized I have all of these and I have absolutely none of these. And when I say I have all of these, I challenge the listener to go to Galatians 5, 19 to 24, I had all of those and none of the other list, all flesh, no spirit. So what happened is I bought into the lie that this list was better than that list. Satan had convinced me not necessarily that he didn't exist, but that one was better than the other. And something that you said earlier is you said that um, Satan gives us deceptive ideas that are normalized by the world. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, anybody that's following politics right now, which this will only take a second. Vivek Ramaswamy gives the very best definition of wokeism of, of, of anything. And it's this idea of society normalizing things that are absolutely nuts. And we as a people end up becoming sounding boards to one another, completely normalizing what is destructive uh, altogether. And we don't realize it because we're in the, the, the eye of the storm, right? And um, Satan is just having his way by feeding us the lie that one list is, is better than the other. Um, and so how does he feed them? How does he feed these lies to us? Well, I don't think he necessarily has to get in his mind to know where our flesh is weak because to another one of your points, he's been doing it for 2,000, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, 5,000 years. He's been attacking mankind, understanding that pride of life is, you know, will tear down every man. Every man is susceptible to pride, you know? Now, maybe not every man is susceptible or as susceptible as sexual temptation as another man, but he'll go down the list, you know, and uh, there'll be something that there's a knee-jerk reaction to. It's kind of like watching the UFC, and you're, you're, you're throwing feints, and you throw one faint and you get a big reaction. It's like, well, there's your tail. You know, it's like, now I know. 
And, um, and I think it's a lot like that is he just tries, 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 tries. And he does it with this legion of, of tempters, uh, that he, that he sends out. And that's why I would say you're spot on by saying, go and see the screw tape letters, go read that. It's one of the more digestible books by C.S. Lewis too, because usually his language is, yeah. yeah, you know, up here. Um, I got some more to say, but if, if you want to comment on any of that. No, I mean, I, I think, um, I think that just the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, there's so much that there is, is uh, like, I don't, um, I don't believe that, um, like I absolutely, I, I guess my tendency at this point in time is to recognize that, um, I don't actually need anyone outside of me to ruin my day. Um, mm. I don't need anyone um, beyond my own thoughts and tendencies uh, toward um, selfishness, toward um, self-preservation that leads to half-truths and um, an avoidance of uh, addressing my problems um, or, uh, you know, uh, neglecting responsibilities like I, I can do all of that on my own um mm. i'm not i am not good enough uh as a as a person to think that um it was or maybe my eyes have been open enough to the fact that i don't need satan or any other tempter to come into my house and and tempt me away from doing the things that matter all i need is um a smartphone or, um, or just my own laziness um, to, to choose that which I would really like to enjoy for a second for a little dopamine hit um, mm. versus like finding uh, any number of ways that I could serve my wife or my children or even my future self by making a good decision. Um, mm. So when when we talk about um, temptation and we talk about uh, doing battle and that sort of thing, I, I am becoming still very much uh, not adept at many of, of these things, but I'm becoming more aware of the the influence of um, the influence that I get to have over these things, but the influence of the spirit in me um, in allowing me to see that I do have disordered desires and I, I will battle them until the day I die. Mm. Um, and it will look different in different seasons of life. I went through a season where, um, you know, I had, uh, I guess as a young, as a young man where a battle, a, an ongoing battle with pornography, and mm -hmm. like that was something that, you know, was like at the front. That was that was the battleground um, for years as a teenager um, and as a young man. And, you know, at this point in time, I can say with um, profound and, and almost disbelief sometimes that's not my battleground. Like, I, I mean, through the power of, of God's grace, like that's not my battleground anymore because like I feel like I've dealt a, the decisive blow to that area of my life. Does that mean that I, I put my sword down and put my feet up? No, like it means that I, mm. I focus more and more energy on loving my wife and submitting to my role as her partner and mm. her and her lover and her husband. And I gotta, I, 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 yeah. I, I gotta come in. That's look that you're bringing up the point that I never addressed it before. And I, I want to put some scripture on it. I want to layer it in scripture. So, yeah. uh, so one, I want to, I want to address this first thing. It's, um, the Ephesians, Ephesians two says you're dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead, Luke. True. Following the course of the world, following the course of the world. Okay, that's the split. Following the course of the world, 
following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, and among who we all once lived the passions of the flesh. Oh, my gosh. Why am I got balloons coming up? Passions of the flesh. I think you, if you do quotes now on Zoom or Teams, it does that. Look at this. That's hilarious, by the way. I'm talking about death and fruits, and I get balloons. Stop it, iPhone, Microsoft. Ridiculous. I'm trying to prove a point here. Hey, Satan, distracting. There it is, Rachel. You want to see Satan at work? They'll send balloons. Mm -hmm. All right, whatever. But you have a spirit, the world, the spirit that's at work with you, which is Satan. We once all lived by the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, the mind. And you were by nature children of wrath. So for everybody, that's where we get the split. That's where we can split it up and say there's the world normalizing it. There's the flesh that's common to man, and then there's actually Satan, his tempters that are picking up the trash and filling in the gaps where the flesh, the iPhone isn't enough, where you give the gun to the to the ape, and instead of ruling his tribe, he puts it down. It's like now we got to call in some reinforcements, and we got to start peddling lies. This guy over here needs some extra effort because he's resisting. This is where I want to go with, with what you just said. It just like hit me. There's tactics. Wherein you can serve yourself and battle against Satan. The problem is identifying when this is necessary, but you said like, you know, porn isn't the battleground anymore, but just because it isn't the battleground, I don't put down my sword. And by the way, for anybody listening, he's referencing Ephesians chapter six, where it says I don't fight against flesh and blood anymore. But 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 essentially these dark forces in these this this crazy realm that sits above us that we cannot see and. It details out the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the 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 breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, um, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. Um, and a few things, a few things. Ephesians 4:26. Your camera went off, by the way. Ephesians 4:26 says. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands. So I would give anybody, Rachel, what I would say is if you feel like you're being lied to, if you feel that pressure, busy yourself. Make sure you're not stagnant, right? Like that would be the first thing. And then more directly to your point is in James chapter 4, 7. Let me see if I can get there. James is always that sneaky little tiny thing after Hebrews. There it is. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, catch this. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I'll kind of like point out a few things. The armor of God is full-facing, Ephesians 6. Guess where you don't have armor, Luke? Your back. We're not meant to flee from Satan. We're, remit, we're meant to pull out our sword and battle him. The question is, what in the world does that look like? Well, that's possessing truth, 
that's possessing the spirit just in and of itself and possessing all those other things, right? Salvation, truth, righteousness, and, and battling about. So busying yourself is one tactic. Another tactic is resisting him, but then being active in drawing near to God. Like clint literally, there's an act that goes into that. And you said, like, instead of doing that, I'm going to love and serve my wife. I'm going to love my wife like God, like Jesus loves the church. And that's a part of busying myself, but that's also a part of centering myself and, and drawing near to God or drawing near to the things of God, clinging to that which God gave you as a resource and a stronghold of, of, um, uh, of peace in your, your life, which is Audrey, uh, which is your kids. You know, it's understanding that, that 10 minutes spent, you know, diving into porn, if you're a married man, is 10 minutes that you didn't give to your family. So that that's just a few things. It's like resisting and busying yourself are two things that, that come to mind. But I think, so uh, not, not I, I think that um, getting to Rachel's question, like, cause that's, cause I feel like we're, we're both fighting off more than maybe I, we're kind of laying groundwork to answer her question. Okay. Um, but like, how does he tell us lies? And then what was the, there was something else like, um, that you, you can, was that how she basically framed it was like, how does yeah. he tell us lies? If he can't, if he can't get inside of us, like, how does he tell us lies? Um, so I think that, um, at this groundwork point, is necessary for the, for this question yeah because it's yeah, just I, deep. no 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 no, no, no I, yeah i think that that's good but i want to yeah. make sure that we do uh try to at least um and and, and you've answered it directly and i want to just add to what you've said on that is um he we're not entering into this on um on a level playing field um and just imagine like going and and you're like i don't know playing basketball you walk into a gym and somebody's like this is this is it man this is the biggest game ever it's one on one and you look it's like well who am i playing and it's like it's lebron but like lebron from 10 years ago like he could jump over you and it's like okay well i'm just going to go and sit down because nothing to this so i mean like you're not entering into this on a level playing field um, in terms of just you doing battle with Satan. And I think that's, that's what a lot of people try to be like, well, if you, you know, follow these 10 steps and, and, and do this, then, then you will uh, defeat him. And it's like, that's not what, you know, Jesus says resist him, but it's all bound up in the person of Jesus. And that's, that's mm -hmm. actually what I was thinking when you were talking is like, when we talk about these, um, like you were saying, like busy yourself, acknowledging that there there's no neutral ground here. You're either embracing and growing in truth or you are embracing or entertaining falsehood. And and the lies lead to death. Um, and that doesn't mean like, you know, oh, I believe that it wasn't a big deal for me to scroll my phone instead of being present with my family that that's not going to like make me drop dead, but it, it might kill a, a moment of connection. And, um, you know, this idea of compound interest, um, it carries over into relationships. And so when you invest and give you, you returns come. Um, and I think that, uh, that's one of those things that it's, it's the easiest lie to believe It's like, Oh, well, it's only five minutes. Oh, it's not that much money. Oh, it's not that big of a deal to miss this one thing or to, you know, and it's like, that's how he, that's how he tells us lies. He lets us give up a little, a little bit of ground here, a little bit of ground there. Um, he's most of us aren't buying these big bold face, like, you know, just ridiculous lies They're You know, it's little things. And our disordered desires, like our tendency to choose ourselves over God, to choose ourselves over our neighbor, um, 
which runs directly counter to uh, Jesus's, um, you know, laying out of the law, which is summed up in love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so if that's the fundamental truth, then everything that runs counter to that would be, uh, even if it has a, an ounce of truth in it, it is deception and it mm-hmm. runs counter it and it, and it puts you further from your flourishing, your, um, coming alive. And so, um, I think that's how he does it with me. I don't, I don't see, um, I mean, occasionally, like when I'm wrestling with doubt, uh, I'll feel like the weight of a really big, I'm like, oh, what if all this is just garbage? <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, like you definitely have those moments. But I would say that in my day to day, you know, as I battle myself and, and battle, you know, falsehood and, and things that are barriers to me and, and those that I love uh, growing and, and living life the way that we are meant to um it's small things so he it's just a little bit at a time and i think um i think that's why like you said you have to stay on guard um and resist and so um you know uh i think that language of um warfare uh in in our culture being in the south and being in the bible belt that is um you know where we have a really high view uh at least in general traditionally a high view of the military a high view of men and women who serve in that capacity um that language is really easy to adapt and adopt um but some people not so much the guy who wrote that book is from the pacific northwest um yeah Mm. and uh has a very different um flavor of uh perception of things like that and he says um he said listen i'm i'm literally a pacifist and he said and this language is really important we're at war um Mm. and i think that that's you know it's the language of that jesus uses i mean like we are not in a neutral ground um Mm -hmm. and so i think that recognizing that and then, like you said, busying yourself, I would get specific on that is like surround yourself with truth. That means mm-hmm. have conversations like this. It means, you know, read scripture, talk about it, wrestle with it. Um, what does this mean? Ask mm-hmm. hard questions. And then um, when you encounter real, when you encounter truth um, in the love of a, a of your spouse or in Mm. in um, a fundamental reality that that's revealed to you in scripture or through teaching, you know, those things, um, they tend to bear fruit, right? I mean, that's what we're told. And yeah. um, so I think that that is uh, something that you have to come back to. And, and sometimes that means setting up, um, you know, controlling your environment where you can, um, if there's something that is a consistent um, barrier to you embracing and living uh, a full life because it, it um, reinforces uh, distraction or um, or something that's a, a lie that you've bought before. Like, you know, for example, something I heard mentioned the other day is like, you know, social media for women in particular, just like can really beat the snot out of their self-image because it's all like it's everything's fabricated people are putting out their you know just perfect pictures and they're like oh well if you just do these three things like you'll have this and nobody can measure up to these um you know airbrushed false um presentations of, of what it is to be fit and healthy and beautiful and um and men it's it's a different twist on the same thing but um that being said like if that's something that is reinforcing falsehood like if you are getting off of a a website or getting off of a social media app and you leave there feeling less Mm. it's like i'm i'm not beautiful or i'm not fit enough or Mm -hmm. i'm not you know i'm not smart enough 
that's I mean that's that's what used to be my biggest thing is like man these guys are writing these things and I'm like man I'm not I'm not on yeah. that level yeah. and um and I and that's my I, I was always someone who um you know even though I, I never thought I was like just a genius or anything but I always measured myself by like how, how smart am I how informed am I um you know it and that is something that I think is a, a, a falsehood that took root in something that's good, which is that I love learning. Mm -hmm. um, but then the falsehood was, Oh, well, I have to know everything. <clears throat> yeah. 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 I think it's, yep. I think I, mm -hmm. I, I love the, I love the little at the time thing. And I would like just cut the compound interest, the, the giving away a little bit of a time, like he's just convincing you. I, I also come at it like another angle. So you brought up truth and it's like something just hit home and um, don't stop me if you've ever heard this because uh, it's like everybody needs to hear this. But like, do you know, have you have you ever read the article or heard the video about how people who are experts in money identify counterfeits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that has always intrigued me. Because it's like there are the, – the amount of counterfeit money that exists on the globe is ever-changing, but only slightly. The, the base can't change that much. It's a dollar bill. It's a 20. It's a 100. It can only look so different. It can only be packaged and presented in so many ways, but every single year there's this – the slightest altercation that that once you've identified, once the battle stops, like to go back to your point, it's like once the battle stops becoming porn, like once the battle stops becoming on this battleground, once you figure out a way to bypass that that Sharpie that they use at Publix to make sure your $100 bill, they're going to come out with a new technology, something that alters, that gets around that, and then now it's something new. So the way that our federal government, the way that our state governments train people who are to look at money and realize that their truth is not to give them the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of rep replicas and to know everything like you were saying, but it's – they give them the correct $100 bill and let them spend countless hours, literally – countless hours with this one true bill mm -hmm. and that my friend is galatians 1 8 in like uh galatians 1 8 says if me or anybody comes and brings another gospel even if it is an angel of god let them be accursed mm -hmm. and that goes to the big weighty lies you know we're not even going to go that direction but it's like we have to know the truth, and the only way that we can stay in the truth to be aware of the lies that we're being told is be filled up with this gospel, this book that's in front of us, or being around like-minded people who are full of that truth and full of that spirit. When I was like coming – it's like something I would tell her. It's like when I was coming out of – um, all – not coming out of, but repenting of all of the sin that was in my life in my early 20s. I would equate sin with steak. I had to fill up on pizza before dinner so that I wouldn't eat the steak. And the pizza was the truth, and I was full of it. And so the thing that looked good to my flesh, I didn't have any more room for. Um, and you know that was one way I battled it. Another thing you said, it's like I think of Satan as – you know, the more time I spend in business, the more I understand the role of like a CEO or a CRO. It's like these guys and these guys and women, their job, I think much like Satan, is to provide tools and to manufacture opportunities. It's like they go out and do the research on how to provide the opportunity to make you successful at work. And there's always a new tool to be used, by the way, in the work world, a new way to get leads, a new way to contact people, uh, a new way to address a disease in your line of work. 
and administer medicines. It's always changing. And it's the CEO's responsibility, the CRO's responsibility to manufacture that opportunity. And I think that's what Satan does is a lies. He is like the CEO of sin. It's all sin, all the time, all lies. And like, like when he was tempting Jesus, he was manufacturing those moments. Some of it was natural to Jesus in that he was hungry, but he was manufacturing the opportunity and saying, just like, just turn that into bread, man. Like, like Jesus was the king of the world. Oh gosh, this is a whole nother thing. I have to share this. I have to share this. This is cool. I just realized Luke earlier in my Christian walk, when, when Satan took Jesus up on the mountain and he said, I will give you all this. If you bow to me, uh-huh. Do you think – this is a direct question to you. Do you think <laughs> Satan owns the world and therefore had ownership that warranted him being able to give it to Jesus? You want a short answer or a long answer? Short. Yes. Okay. This is fun. This might turn into a long conversation. Because I was on board with that for forever, and mm-hmm. I changed my mind. Okay. I don't. I don't think. I don't think he owns it. Jesus uh, is a uh, light. Uh, own. Depends oh, no, on the word. Depends Satan. on the own. And that's and that's something fun to talk about, right? Like, I mean, we can break that down. But okay. let's enter entertain. Let's pretend that my interpretation is right for a second and. It reiterates Satan is a liar. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. So for him to – he was – what Jesus saw was you're offering me something that I already own. This is a silly thing to me. It's like you don't own the world. You're a liar. You can't give this to me. You don't have that authority. What are you talking about? Jesus had that truth in him. He knew that what Satan was saying was a lie. And in the same way, I think Jesus, I mean, Satan offers you this, that list, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and says, like, you can have all of this. But he doesn't package it up like strife and jealousy and enmity and all that stuff. He says women, fame, money. You can have importance. You can you can be smart. And what all that it causes all those symptoms, but he doesn't he doesn't share that with you. He doesn't share you the he doesn't give you the list and say you can have all these horrible things in your life. He says, I'm gonna give you all these good things. And all underneath all those good things are death, bro. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. and and so he packages in such a way that it's just a lie. And he, as the CEO of sin, manufactured this opportunity for Jesus to like. Have the world. But Jesus is like, no, dude, I'm the CEO of the universe. You're nuts if you think you have the power to give this to me. You know, you're you're a liar. Mm-hmm. Get away from me, bro. Not bro. Yeah. Get away from me, dude. Anyway, that was a lot. And I just like stream of conscience really hard from point to point like a straight squirrel. But yeah. Giving it we'll to you, to man. Re- what do you think? We'll, we will. Uh, we'll need to revisit the, Let's do that, it. that interpretation at some point. Let's do it. Um, I would love to. But uh, yeah, in the in the essence or in the interest interest of time, um, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to squash you. <laughs> um, well, no, I just, I, I, yeah, I just think that that's a that's an interesting exploration. Um, but I, I think, um, you can't say interesting. It's a non word. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think that that is a thought provoking uh, conversation because 
<laughs> I see where you're coming from, but I come from a different angle at this point. I wish we had um, another hour. Yeah. Um, man, yeah, that's that's worth that's worth talking about. I know, but I think fundamentally, it you know it it comes back to um, the pursuit of truth, which is what I would want someone to uh, take from our rambling this morning. Uh, if anybody listens to this, Audrey, if you're still watching, um, is just like, you know, what, you know, what's truth and how do I get more of that? Because truth, I believe fundamentally comes down to something good, uh, which is that, you know, we have been created by a good God and we have fallen and we exist in a fallen state in a fallen world that is under the dominion of what Jesus, who Jesus calls the, the prince of this earth, which is the father of lies. Um, And while we are dealing with that reality, hope broke through in the person of Jesus and through his life, death and resurrection. And then um, when he departed and he uh, released the Holy spirit uh, into the world and into um, this space, enemy territory, um, and it has begun his process of reclaiming uh, yeah. one individual at a time and then acting through this family of broken people who have been reclaimed and restored and renewed and brought to life. Uh, mm. And we call that group of people the church. And mm. we, as the church, are so deeply flawed and in fighting internal battles in our day to day. And so that spills out in all kinds of terrible, terrible things that have been done. But you still see we we press on and we're carried by grace through his spirit uh, that um, animates our our lives and fills our minds and renews our minds. Uh, Literally, we're told to renew our minds um, and be transformed by that. And I would say that I've experienced a taste of that and I want more of it. And I would welcome uh, anyone else into asking hard questions, um, pressing deeper into the arguments that exist, and then, you know, try practicing some of the, um, some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, I know when we talked about knowing God in our first conversation, uh, prayer and community and scripture, I mean, those are uh, the means by which we enter into truth and we call out the lies Because like you said, like there's a million ways that we can be deceived, but there's one truth. That's it. And and so that's it. And and, and so, yeah, I mean, I I think that that your analogy of that is is perfect for that, because that's we probably could have just said that um, and it saved everybody a lot of time. No, Um, it takes a while. It's fun to to come to that conclusion, man. I think people need to see us think and get there. But yeah, I think I think that's what it comes down to is um, look to truth. You know, going back to John one, uh, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I think um, truth and light, they they are intertwined. Um, and so, w- once you flip the light on, you don't want to go back to the dark. Yeah. We have like two minutes, unless you're. I'm about to, yeah, I'm about to have to welcome uh, uh, another. I want to ask you one. I want to ask you one question, one personal question, and I'll I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Also, um, sure. Just as a benefit to whoever's watching, um, if you could identify one, we know the answer now. The answer is. The answer is get close to truth pursue truth and that's the conclusion of the conversation let's not worry how about this to address the question directly let's not worry about not that the question isn't important and i'm glad we addressed it but how satan how satan does what he does let's just focus on the truth and we won't even have to worry about that question like that's i think that's a good conclusion for our conversation but i would like to ask you this and so I can offer up prayers for it, and I'll say the same thing. It's like if if you could identify one lie right now 
that Satan tells you that you're having victory over, that you're struggling through right now? Like, what would that lie be? And how, what, what truth do you use in scripture to combat it? I would say, um, just off the cuff, the lie is, um, I don't have it all together. I should have it all together. And by that, I mean my finances, my plan, my, uh, my household in terms of logistics. I mean, our house, uh, we can't keep it clean because we got kids running around and we both work full time and get to the end of the day and, uh, you know, look at our budget and look at the next few years of small children and me going back to school. And I'm just like, I can't do it. I I need to tap out. I need to, I need to give up on this, um, this unhealthy ambition uh, to go back to school. And that's not rooted in anything true. That's rooted in uh, a falsehood that like, if I can't see the way, then there is no way. And Jesus tells us the truth that I would combat that with would be, you know, er, talking about, um, I think it's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably other places too when he talks about like, don't worry about tomorrow. Like, like tomorrow will will come, but I made you for for today. Um, Like you were made to live. today and that doesn't mean don't plan i don't don't think that that means that at all proverbs is filled with you know planning and stewardship instructions and things like that but um when i try to take on more than today i get squashed Um, yeah because i mean he made me to encounter the moments that i'm encountering right now not to fight fight tomorrow i don't know what's going to come tomorrow so that's that's the lie is that i should be able to handle the next three years all in one moment and the fact mm. is, I cannot. Mm. And I think my, yeah, and by the way, that is like directly healed by the word F-A-I-T-H, faith. It's like, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. I have faith that you're going to take care of the very next day. I mm. would say mine is maybe more common to the tradition that I was raised in. And it's really hard for me to shake even now holding on completely to the sovereignty of God in the most, maybe not even most, the most intensive ways, but surely like academically the most intensive ways holding to like the, these, these doctrines of grace. (laughs) It's like, um, but mine is, you're not doing enough. It's like, mm-hmm. what a what a weird lie for Satan to tell me. Um, you're not doing enough for him. Therefore, he doesn't want you. And it is so evident from Scripture that that's a lie. I can pick up the book of Galatians and read all however many chapters. I think there's six, six seven chapters. Oh, that's going to make me mad that I don't know that. But – uh. And completely dismiss that lie. But it still has strength in my life. And I'm so annoyed at my lack of boldness sometimes. And he's like, well, because you're not bold, he's going to reject you. Like, that's because you haven't talked to your neighbor, like, and like told him about Jesus, like literally the guy that's next door to you, you're damned. He's going to say, you're not a good and faithful servant like that. I fear that. And that happens to me. And I know that's a lie because it's a half truth. It's like because you aren't doing this one thing that scripture says, give up, brother, give up. Yeah. Just yeah. take on the take on this list of, of good things. It's easy to pursue these things over here instead of mm-hmm. wrestling with the fact that you haven't done this other thing that. God commanded you to do because you haven't done it. Right. Yeah. So it's a nasty one. It is. And it's, it, I mean, it, yeah, it's a, it's a subtle half truth sometimes. 
the way that that gets whispered in. Yeah. Because what he, what he's doing is he's he's trying to beat you to your punch, like um, using that analogy, that combat. Like you may be contemplating, you know, making a move, and then when you haven't done it yet, or you know, you're right on the cusp of launching uh, something that would be really productive for you or for someone else, uh, for the glory of God right before you are throwing that that punch so to speak he's trying to interrupt you with a with a quick jab to say you haven't done it yet there's no point now you didn't do it like so and he and he, he reframes something that was true which is that you have capacity to do good things and then he takes it and says well because you haven't done every good thing Mm, you know, because you, know, you don't know everything. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, because you haven't because you haven't done every one of the things that was available to you. And see, that's that's one of the biggest lies of all, which is the um, the all or nothing like mindset of like, well, if you didn't do everything right, then what was what was even the point? Why did you even show up? And it's like, no, that's not that's not it at all. There's the work's been accomplished. The, the decisive victory has occurred. We're still in the in the cleanup phase, but like where there's still battle, but like the the tide will will get to where it needs to get to. So, yeah, that's that's yeah. A tough one, man. It is. It is. It's 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 consistent, and mm. you know if Satan if Satan had the opportunity to take Jesus into the desert. One more time, even though he didn't take him, the spirit drove him. Ooh, whole another conversation. But uh, I think he would attack him in the same exact ways because what else is there? Yeah. Anyways, good talk, man. Right, man. Uh, yeah. I think we I think we answered the question somewhat. I think so too. I'll make sure Audrey has a really good question for us next week. Yes. No, that's on her. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, one more one more thing. Second Corinthians four four says Satan who is God of this world, mm -hmm. has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So there is some scripture that says he's the God of the world. Maybe. We, we, can, we can unpack that at some point. <laughs> maybe. Two guys in a Bible comes and gets that and by the way we're going to throw that title on the table and maybe we sacrifice it on the altar of like questions of wives or something oh, I, I but yeah i'm not yeah that sounds good man always good to Hi, boy. tell audrey yesterday all right we'll do see, see you man, man.